Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, back here once again uh, with another cool video. Uh, uh, what was life like after the Bronze Age collapse? Uh, I don't know. I'm assuming pretty bad. Uh, we, we did. We just did the uh, the Bronze Age. You know what the Bronze Age was, and basically brought a lot of life, uh, brought a lot, a lot of community, it just brought people together. Uh, also brought a lot of war. You know, cause, you know, because you're, you're able to just, just build more things, and you know, you know, you got to you got to trade with it. I don't know, it, it just it just end up doing Bronze Age. Just you know, kind of just brought a lot of people together and just kind of create community, and it, it just like, made the world seem like a, like a bigger place kind of thing. You know, it wasn't just little clans here and there. You know, so uh, the Bronze Age collapse. I'm I guess I'm assuming you know, like the rich. You know, like everything was all great. You know, it was like things are awesome and flourishing. And I'm guessing, obviously, the collapse is like I think everyone's gonna get desperate, kind of thing. You know, and it's gonna be kind of like an every man for themselves kind of thing. Uh, so I'm guessing because it collapses, so obviously it's not good. Uh, I almost did the uh, so I would definitely recommend doing the the previous uh, the one i did out of the bronze age uh, i actually thought we doing the, the copper I think copper was obviously before the bronze age so I, I was actually considering doing that one right now but i might do that next uh because that seemed like the beginning of civilization in general like the copper is it called the copper age i don't know i don't know but anyways guys what was life like after the bronze age collapse this will be, i think this will be super interesting uh these usually are so uh, i mean his history i mean what's not to like history is awesome but anyways got a lot of reading news those of you new also i got a lot of playlists on geography and history and war and stuff definitely check those out but further ado we're gonna get to this hopefully amazing video oh yeah um uh, doing the the same channel that uh was it epimetheus that i did the bronze age you know so uh I, I actually I really liked how they did it, so I'm gonna use the same channel for this one. So yeah, three, two, one. Like and subscribe. Bam. Building a little bit of context, we need to answer the question: What was the Bronze Age collapse? Explained as fast as possible, otherwise it would no longer be just a little bit of context. At the beginning of the 12th century BC. The most populous, prosperous, and technologically advanced empires on planet Earth were all right next to each other. With the notable exception of the Shang Dynasty and what is now China, these states formed a robust interconnected system of economic, political, and cultural exchange that endured for many centuries. And then, in the span of a few decades, diplomacy, trade, and prosperity gave way to famine, war, and chaos. The resulting devastation was so severe that even the ability to read and write was lost for hundreds of years in many regions throughout the greater Near East. In what is now Greece, written records disappeared for almost 500 years. This loss of civilization was so extraordinary that this collapse has often been called an apocalypse. This video is about those that survived. Context over. But first, before we answer the question who survived, let's briefly talk about who did not survive. I guess it's gonna, it's gonna like tell me it's like how did like all of a sudden it's famine and war. It's like I think it's like the Bronze Age class. Like oh, there's no more bronze anymore. But you know, obviously that's not it. But that, that was always the first thing that came to my mind. They just ran out of bronze. Stupid, huh? But anyways, uh, yeah, okay, good. It's gonna tell me anyway. So I don't I don't know why I paused it. But first, before we answer the question who survived, let's briefly talk about who did not survive. Generally speaking, if one were a general, king, queen, priest, noble, or any of the long-established ruling class, chances of survival were slim. These fine folks were often the first to go. They were not only the primary targets of foreign invaders, but also often fell victim to their own people's wrath. When these political and religious leaders, who controlled the lion's share of the land's wealth, failed to deliver on their promises of safety, prosperity, and a belly full of food, they were naturally blamed for the bad times. However, war, famine, and sick. I mean, that makes sense, but I mean, a lot of the regular people are, are going to die first before I think they would turn on, like, you know, 
their leaders, you know, like you say, you have a population of a million, it'd probably take, you know, like, a hundred thousand people to die like okay like enough's enough and then bam we turn on the ruler and then even then you know a lot of these rulers have like security right that could basically you know they have their armies that could fight back against their people kind of thing so i guess i guess they could you know they could be i don't know if they'd be the first to go but i i definitely get what they're saying uh but then again, you know, you know, who knows what I know? But I guess they were the kind of the first uh, number one target. I mean, obviously, armies aren't what they were are today. So, I mean, their own armies, I guess, would turn against them. I guess that's what they're saying. So, never mind. But wow, you think back, you think that just you know being higher, like you get you have the best of everything. You know, you get the food and everything. So you think you're set. But I guess you know, when someone's looking to murder someone, they're not. They're gonna look for the people who have all that stuff. Sickness were not caused by poor leadership alone, and the bad times became worse. Conflict became constant, and life expectancy was certainly not great for military men. Also was a bad time to try to stay alive for most non-military men as well. Farmers, who would have been the majority of the population pretty much everywhere, mostly died off, as irrigation systems were destroyed and marauders roamed the countryside. The city folk didn't do any better and probably did a worse job at surviving on average. Scribes in particular seem to have failed at living, given the lack of written records from the ensuing Dark Age that followed the Bronze Age collapse. In addition to scribes, the butcher, the baker, and the chariot maker, and pretty much everyone... Okay, so yeah, the Bronze Age collapse, like the 40-year period, they said, and then I guess, so there's a Dark Age, I guess that's that 500-year period where there's just nothing... So I guess you can't really explain anything that 500 years because there's really no written records of it. But I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself, but yeah. See what they, what they say again? In addition to scribes, the butcher, the baker, and the chariot maker, and pretty much everyone who lived in towns and cities didn't make it, with few exceptions. Without a massive base of rural farmers, well-maintained irrigation, and imported goods that were necessary to support a city, demoralized city dwellers became the victims of invaders marauders, or themselves. While life in the big city vanished, or greatly diminished, there were some exceptions, the most notable of which was Egypt. Compound w the year is 1077, roughly 100 years after the Bronze Age collapse. The once mighty Egyptian empire has shrank into a shriveled husk of its former glory. Like its pharaoh, Ramses XI, who is a tired and dying old man. He is the last of many pharaohs to be named Ramses. He is also the last native Egyptian pharaoh to rule over a united Egypt. Like his immediate predecessors, his long reign was a sad one. Long gone were the days of god kings, beloved by the people, throwing lavish parties to celebrate imperial victories in far off lands. The Egyptian economy crashed, Prices of basic goods skyrocketed, and taxes were high to maintain the army. Consequently, the malcontented urban population frequently revolted. In those times, pharaohs were more likely to wage war against their own people than a foreign adversary, and rebellions were brutally put down. Egypt managed to defeat foreign invasions and dominate its own dwindling population, while most contemporary empires and kingdoms collapsed. Part of Egypt's strategy was to hire many of the invaders. Now, that's what I was saying, but like, you know, being a leader through all this, like, famine and stuff like that, you know, you just turn your army against your own people to kind of stay alive. I mean, apparently it worked for this guy. He lived pretty long, even though it was a sad, sad reign. I mean, he survived, right? Kingdoms collapsed. Part of Egypt's strategy was to hire many of the invaders as mercenaries like the Sea Peoples, and, most notably, many, many Libyans were hired. The army was paid well, while Egypt's borders slowly shrank. All was sacrificed to feed the Egyptian war machine, including the pharaoh's power. Hmm. In the Nile Delta, Tanis rose as a rival power center to the old capital of Memphis. There, the strong man Smendes ruled, Little is known of his origins and path to power, but it was likely similar to Herihor, the ruler of Thebes. Herihor rose through the ranks of the Egyptian army, eventually becoming not only the Egyptian supreme military commander and grand vizier of the south, but the viceroy of Kush, 
And finally, the high priest of Ammon at Thebes. Herhor took on some pharaonic titles and iconography while still acknowledging Ramses XI's authority, predominantly in name only. The power of Egypt's military, secular, and religious institutions were combined and wielded by one autocrat, monopolizing the violence and corruption that have always been a part of power. Herhor not only held absolute control over his citizens' life by the sword, but also their afterlife. Herhor was indicative of the violent, brutal, and efficient men that came to dominate Egypt for centuries to come. Following Ramses XI's death, Egypt split in two was solidified. The two new rival dynasties that formed engaged in a long-standing, mostly cold war with each other. Ramses XI was never buried in his tomb. Instead, it became a workshop for stripping ancient mummies of their valuables in a semi-respectful manner. What? Even the gold on the coffins was scraped off. The methodical manner this appears to have been carried out. I mean, I expect that anyway, just from people, you know, pirates or whatever, that are just trying to steal stuff to, to survive. I mean, you get buried with like thousands, millions of dollars worth of gold and stuff. I mean, someone's going to go for it. I mean, like, I'm sure in today's age, you know, you bury someone with all that and someone's going to grave rob it, right? Uh, I mean, don't they do that? to this day like the pyramids don't they like try and like search for things in the tombs and stuff you know of value but i guess that stuff was probably already long gone uh, curious if they still find like expensive gold stuff these days means these mummies were probably looted by state actors massive spending on the army and an overtaxed demoralized populace made the fabulous wealth buried in the ground a tempting target for state-sponsored looting the new dynasties that had access to temple treasure maps may have not viewed their predecessors' tombs as sacred as before. Right? These pharaohs no longer boasted of foreign victories or massive building projects, but occasionally boasted of maintenance on crumbling monuments, or, if they were less honest, wrote their names over old masterworks, pretending they had built them. As an isolated, impoverished Egypt lingered on, those not so fortunate as to live in a post-apocalyptic dystopian dictatorship run by an authoritarian megalomaniac lived a very different life. The Egyptians credited the piratical band of Mediterranean maritime marauders known as the Sea Peoples with the destruction of the international system of states they were a part of. This view was based off of their own personal experience. They're basically like Vikings, right? I mean, they're just kind of like the sea people coming, looting, and leaving. You know, they're kind of like, I guess they're just, they're just not from, you know, up north. They're just Vikings of a different area. I mean, they're not Vikings. They're just kind of other people looting. But, you know, you know what I'm saying. Kind of like Vikings, right? of being invaded by the Sea Peoples multiple times, while the Eastern Mediterranean they were familiar with was ravaged and plundered. However, more than any nautical threat, much more insidious, formidable, and familiar forces played a larger role in bringing the great empires of bronze to their ruin. Land people. The Grand Hittite capital city of Hattusa was sacked by a coalition of former subjects and new enemies. Foremost among them were the Kaskas, a fierce tribe of mountain warriors, who were a long time off and on again Hittite vassal, and now they were out for vengeance. Like Hattusa, Babylon, the intellectual and cultural center of Mesopotamia was sacked, pillaged, and plundered, and much of its population massacred by the Assyrian king, Tukulti Ninurta. As the city slowly recovered, it was sacked again by the Elamites, plunging southern Mesopotamia into a centuries-long dark age. The Elamites were by far the most organized, powerful, and populous of all the major mountain peoples of the Late Bronze Age. In addition to the Elamites, there were many more petty kingdoms, cities, and towns of the Anatolian, southern Caucasus, and Zagros mountain ranges that had long-standing antagonistic relationships with the kingdoms and empires of the flatlands. When the much more populous flatlanders were united and strong, they pushed their weight around. They marched their armies throughout the mountains and extorted tribute from the overwhelmed mountain people in exchange for not burning down their crops, towns, and cities. When the tables were turned, in times of civil war, famine, or any other time of weakness, the tough and patient mountain people flooded into the flatlands, wow. collecting tribute and sacking cities. This usually ended when enough organizations 
I mean, just like it's just like the wars we've been watching, like the Ottoman Wars. I mean, you see your enemy down, you go take advantage of the situation, try to get land and whatever you're trying to get, and then when the roles reverse, they do the same thing to you, right? It, it's this has been going on forever, right? Anyways, organized resistance was mounted. War, as was sometimes the case, the mountain peoples settle among the flatlanders as a new ruling class, eventually assimilating into their culture. Like had been the case with the earlier Hurrians, Gutians, and Kassites. In contrast to their success, in the early decades of the Bronze Age collapse, the warlike Assyrians defeated just about every mountain people that attempted to establish themselves in Mesopotamia. Assyria appeared to be on the verge of holding the collapsing age together by their own force of will and brutality until they met their match. A people more stubbornly resilient than the mountain peoples and more terrifying than the sea peoples. Land peoples part two. Wastelanders. Floors lava. Long before the Bronze Age collapsed, during its most stable and prosperous epoch, there were those that just didn't fit into society. Some were criminal fugitives, bandits, or those who just wanted freedom. On the southern periphery of the Fertile Crescent, a multitude of small familial clans eked out an existence as pastoral nomads. A little bit of water, or patch of grass, could mean the difference between life and death. Consequently, these people were fiercely competitive, highly mobile, and nearly indestructible. In contrast to the mountain peoples, who hoarded away wealth of metals and other highly prized resources in their remote citadels, the people of the wasteland had very little wealth which the Bronze Age empires could extort from them, so they were usually left alone. The wastelanders periodically visited the region's cities and traded sheepskins and other assorted loot with the settled peoples. But their most notable role in pre-collapsed Bronze Age society was as mercenaries. These tough tribal mm. people, with an extensive knowledge of the region's terrain, would be frequently hired to guide and guard caravans, or attack, raid, or harass one city on behalf of another. Huh. Interesting. You By the later 12th little. century BC, their time had come. The age of epic battles fought between collapsing empires was drawing to a close. This gave way to a short period of Assyrian dominance over much of the Near East. But despite their success, the empire was exhausted, overextended, and the land they ruled over was devastated. Then, the floodgates opened, and the wastelanders poured in. Chaldeans, Sutians, and Aramaeans were the most numerous of the tribal peoples to migrate into Mesopotamia. The countryside was devastated, but in comparison to the wasteland, where clans could spend generations fighting over access to a well, the depopulated rubble of the old world would have appeared as if the gates of heaven had opened up. Now they had much better things to squabble over, like gold, wine, slaves, and prestige. Yeah, I, I can imagine, you know, like one... It's like you're off in like a desert and there's nothing around. It's like you're suffering just for like a for the rain for a drink of water. Then all of a sudden, like you're in this like forested area. I mean, it would feel like heaven. Like wow, there's streams everywhere. Even even though there might not be everywhere, but just finding one stream probably feels like amazing and leaves and I don't know. I, I can definitely see what they mean there. So these guys are like, we got it going on, man. Like, they've, they've been roughing it out. Like, this is this is nothing for them. Whoa. Better things to squabble over, like gold, wine, slaves, and prestige. Where mass irrigated fields of grains had once stood, there was more than enough wild grasses growing for sheep to have a hearty meal or two. Because of this, pastoral nomads thrived after the collapse, and their way of life became the dominant lifestyle almost everywhere in the Near East. And as the sheep population grew... So did the population of those who ate them, especially the Arameans. Because of their mobile nature, the Assyrians found it nearly impossible to stamp them out with conventional military means. Assyrian kings frequently boasted of wiping the Arameans off the face of the earth. Then, a few years later, they would boast of defeating them again and again, but this time for good. The Assyrians were not keen on keeping records of their own defeats. But three signs point to the likelihood they frequently lost during this period. One, the large number of campaigns they waged against the Arameans 
Two, they made and kept peace with survivors from their old enemy Babylon, who was also being overrun by nomadic pastoralists. Number three, they ultimately abandoned their empire and retreated into their heartland, which itself was under Aramean assault. Some of their cities were sacked, and even an aqueduct to their capital city was destroyed, and it lay unrepaired for decades. The Arameans were everywhere. Some daring warlords captured remote Assyrian mountain citadels and outposts. These were used as the base of operations for further marauding. Numerous small bands of Arameans stalked the countryside, enslaving rural farmers. Consequently, many refugees flooded into Assyria's cities. This caused food shortages, sickness, popular unrest, and ultimately civil war. While many still maintained their nomadic way of life, over time, many of the illiterate Aramean herdsmen became kings. Many of these kings were merely the rulers of fortified towns and villages built on the ruins of what were once cities. There were some legitimately powerful Aramean kings and chieftains who could marshal thousands of men into battle. However, the independent and competitive nature of the Arameans meant that they never united into a larger empire, and were frequently at war with themselves, as they were with almost everyone else. Okay, so I'm guessing now, like, you know, the, you know, the, I guess the end of the collapse, that's going to be their downfall. They can't, you know, they stop the squabbling to kind of get a good force going to, to fight the outsiders that are probably going to push in and take their land because they can't stick together. And yeah, it's not, it's not looking good for them, but dang, man, these guys just took over, man. They like bullies just came in and taking what they want. And just feels like there's a, like a bunch of gangs just everywhere, you know, and the gangs can't get along, but you know, they're doing all right for themselves compared to everybody else. In the West, there was a chunk of the Hittite Empire that never fell. It transitioned into a collection of loosely allied city-states, called the Neo-Hittites. Here the Aramean onslaught appears to have been slightly more gentle. In this case all we know is that around 1000 BC, the rulers of many of the city-states there came to have Aramean names, and the culture gradually became more Aramean. One possible scenario is that the Hittite cities in this region became so sick of being constantly extorted by a never-ending series of Aramean warlords, chiefs, and petty kings, that one day they said, hey, you want to come here and be a real king and defend us from the rest of your buddies? That ended up working, and a bunch of other cities followed the same strategy. The long-standing, most powerful, and stable Aramean kingdom was Aram Damascus. From there, the Arameans launched many campaigns against the Hebrew tribes to their south. Some scholars believe the Hebrews, or the Habiru, mentioned in earlier Egyptian records, while others think the term Habiru was a generic term for some of the wastelanders in the region, similar to how Alamu appears to have been a generic term for wastelanders to the northeast. So it could be said the Arameans were Alamu, but not all Alamu were Arameans. The Hebrews also had nomadic pastoralist roots, and followed a somewhat similar trajectory as the Arameans did gradually becoming city dwellers and founding formidable states. Despite the chaotic age, many of the battered city-states in the Levant enjoyed a golden age of sort, after things started to settle down a little bit after 1000 BC. The region was no longer at the crossroads of powerful empires, which allowed the kingdoms and city-states there to thrive and fight amongst themselves for a little while. Okay. To the south, more than 200 years after the Bronze Age collapse, the semi-nomadic Libyans that had poured into the Nile Delta and served in the Egyptian army slowly took over the Egyptian military, government, and finally the throne. The Libyan pharaoh Shoshenk united the land, and for the first time, a foreign dynasty ruled all of Egypt. Wow. After the Bronze Age collapse, it was undoubtedly the warlike semi-nomadic herdsmen that proved themselves the best survivalists. This ability to survive was in large part due to their mobility. They could move away from greater threats and take advantage of weaker targets. Their society was efficient, low maintenance, and based around small united family units. Before I get back to our regular programming, a brief message from this video sponsors. This video has been sponsored by Bronze. Tired of your copper bending or your iron rusting? I recommend you buy bronze and a lot of it. Why buy Bitcoin when you can buy a pound of bronze for a very affordable two dollars and two cents a pound. Now that is what I call a bargain. This video is also sponsored by my fantastic patrons over on Patreon, who have helped out this channel through the tough danger. 
They were master yeah. negotiators and could possibly barter to save their own life. Merchants would have known many languages and social customs to get around foreign areas. One piece of anecdotal evidence is that during the Bronze Age collapse, the Assyrian king, Ashur Balkala, built the world's first recorded zoo. This is while his empire was being torn apart by civil war and Aramean tribal Why? incursion. So even though good old Asher Belkala may have failed in setting his priorities straight, his merchants did succeed in acquiring exotic animals from far off lands for their king's zoo, which included an ape and a crocodile. Their ability to travel through hostile terrain and return with such unwieldy cargo is a testament to the merchant's resourcefulness. Which or like how crazy the king is, things are going crazy and falling apart. Oh, let's just build a zoo. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I'm sure the people were so appreciative of this. You know, they just want some bread and some water, and you're here, like, bringing crocodiles and monkeys back, and I'm sure the people probably just wanted to eat them. They didn't want to zoo. They just wanted to eat the animals that you're bringing back, I'm sure. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. I guess you wouldn't know back then if somebody was going insane. Like, at the Roman times, you know, you knew it has some, there's actually some like, accounts, I guess, of, I guess, I guess emperor is going insane or whatnot, but I guess you would never know that back then. They would that would not be part of the records, right? Which may indicate they were good at surviving. Bonus survivors. The Greek island of Euboea is the only example I can think of where the pre-existing farmers survived and thrived after the collapse. Once a Mycenaean backwater, the island became a fortress where small family farms grew and banded together in a collective defense. Centuries later, the Eubians were the first Greeks to emerge from their Dark Ages, establish colonies in far-off lands, and rediscover writing. What happened after this post-apocalyptic age? The short answer is Assyria. If you enjoyed this video, you will probably enjoy Assyria, my many okay. other videos on the Bronze Age and the ancient... So basically, uh, after that, things started to flourish. Syria took over and just like, had this giant empire, pretty much, right? Uh... Yeah, there you go. Wow, it's a lot of land. But anyways, that was that was interesting. It's kind of neat how it's like the collapse happens. All these strong, powerful countries, you know, kind of went at war with themselves and like the little outsider people that were like not an issue that were kind of just doing their own thing, just kind of took advantage of the situation, destroyed all that. And then after that, then you have these uh, wastelanders come in, and since they're like can withstand any kind of thing, anything, they kind of came in, took over, and then I guess after a while, they're like, uh, I'd be kind of cool to kind of be a king or like leader of something. So they kind of with these, they're welcome to get certain kings or kind of welcome to certain areas to help certain places, and I don't know, things just started thriving. But anyways, I thought that was super neat. I hope that you know. I hope yeah, you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys were able to follow it. I pretty much was able to follow it. Uh, it was, that was really cool. It definitely interesting. It's definitely, a, like I said, I'm not very familiar with this uh, part of the world. So it's like, you know, the, any kind of, oh, I guess back in 200 BC, I'm not, or 100, uh, 1000 BC or whatever, I'm not going to kind of recognize names. But Assyria, I mean, Syria, Assyria, I mean, right? recognize that right but uh, anyways yeah like and subscribe uh let me know your thoughts below and catch you guys in future videos i, I like you know, some of the humor this this channel uses you know definitely uh definitely adds to the flavor of the videos but anyways guys see you guys later peace have a great day great night i am out of here